Did God reveal to the prophet Isaiah a clue as to where we might find the very first and most amazing prophecy ever revealed in the Bible? Listen to Isaiah 46, 9 and 10 and see if you can discover the clue that unlocks the mystery location of the Bereshit prophecy. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is none else. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. Are we to understand these words of God literally? Were there events ordained in heaven that both have and will unfold on the earth that were declared by God in the beginning. If God's words are to be taken literally, then where might we find this amazing revelation? Our search begins with the very first word that God revealed in the Bible. This revelation was disclosed in the language we know as Hebrew, the only language in the world that is actually three languages in one. Hebrew is composed of 22 pictograms that are symbols or letters meant to be assembled to form ideas that we call words. Hebrew is also a number language. Each of the 22 pictograms are also numbers that each has a meaning, a meaning based on how that number is used in the Bible. Finally, we have the phonetic Hebrew language, the oldest language in the world a language that has been miraculously preserved and is spoken today by a people who have been miraculously preserved and living once again after thousands of years of dispersion in the promised land of Israel. The existence of Israel and the preservation of the Hebrew language is proof positive that you can take the Word of God literally. Take a look at the graphic representation of the very first word that God spoke to Moses the prophet who chiseled it into stone letter by letter over 3,400 years ago. Keep in mind that Hebrew is written from right to left. Do you recognize the very first word revealed in the Bible? It is Bereshit, the Hebrew word we translate into English as in the beginning, and it's found in Genesis 1.1. It is in this single word, Bereshit, that is literally translated as in beginning, that we will discover what God revealed about the end from the beginning. In order to recognize the prophetic significance of the six-letter Hebrew word, Bereshit, we need to figure out the meaning of each of the six letters or pictograms that were from the very beginning and are to this day embedded in the language that God created in order to reveal his living word to mankind. Bet. Bet is the very first letter or pictogram revealed in God's word. Bet is the pictogram of the floor plan of a house or tent that brings to mind the idea of a home. Bet is also the number two. Let's begin unfolding the most amazing revelation ever disclosed in the Bible by asking the one question every child would ask if he saw a picture of a tent. Who is inside the tent? The letter bet pictured as a tent is also the one letter in Hebrew that is literally translated as in or inside. So perhaps asking who is in or inside the tent is not such a silly question. Just who is inside the tent? Perhaps the next Hebrew letter will give us a clue. Resh. The letter Resh is a symbol of a head that brings to mind the idea of the head person or prince. Resh, the second letter in Bereshit, is also the number 200. 200 is the number that is used in the Bible to declare the all-sufficiency of God and the complete insufficiency of man. Amazingly, the first two letters in the word Bereshit is the Hebrew word for son. Bet Resh, pronounced Bar, is translated son in Hebrew. So now we know who is in the tent. He is someone's son. He is also the head person or prince. But whose son is he? The third letter in Bereshit gives us the answer. Aleph. 
The third letter in Bereshit is Aleph, pictured as an ox. Aleph is a symbol of the strong leader, pictured as an ox. Aleph is also the number one. It's not surprising that Aleph is the first letter in Elohim, the name of God first revealed in the Bible. Aleph is a picture that is ideally meant to convey the idea of God, God the Father, the strong leader that guides and directs his family. But wait, there's more. When we add Aleph to the first two letters in Bereshit, we discover another Hebrew word. Bet Resh Aleph, the first three Hebrew letters in Bereshit, is also the Hebrew word for created or creator. So who is in the bet or tent? The bet resh. The sun is in the tent. Whose son is he? He is the bet resh aleph, the son of God. But he's also the bet resh aleph, the creator. Sheen. Sheen, the fourth letter in Bereshit, is pictured as teeth. Teeth press down, crush, and destroy. Sheen is also a signature letter, the one letter that God uses to signify his special ownership of something. Sheen is also the number 300. 300 is an amplification of the sacred number 3. 3 means divine perfection. 300 signifies a divinely appointed blood sacrifice that results in victory over death. Amazingly, we find another Hebrew word nested in Bereshit. Sheen, the fourth letter in Bereshit, is also the last letter in the Hebrew word Resh. Notice that the single Hebrew letter Resh, that is the second letter in Bereshit, is also the three-letter Hebrew word Resh, spelled Resh, Aleph, Sheen. Resh, the three-letter word, confirms the meaning of the single letter Resh. To be clear, Resh is not only the name of a letter, it's also a three-letter word that means prince, or head person, or first in Hebrew. Now I want to show you something that's very important. Remember the Hebrew word bar translated as sun? The word that we found nested in the first two letters in Bereshit? Notice that in the word bar, the resh, or prince, is in or inside the bet. He is inside the tent. With that in mind, we must ask why God put both the single letter resh and then nested the three-letter word resh in Bereshit. Let me share at least one obvious reason. The reason is that the Lord wanted us to notice something. He wanted us to notice that the resh aleph sheen, the prince, has come out of the tent. The prince has gone out of his home. A picture is worth a thousand words. The prince who was inside the house is now coming out of the house. Are you starting to understand how God communicates with his children? For of such is the kingdom of heaven, our future home. Why is the prince coming out of the tent? The next three pictographs that compose the Hebrew word Bereshit give us the answer. If sheen, the picture of teeth, means to crush and destroy... Then we must ask, is the Son of God coming out of the tent to be crushed and destroyed? Or is he coming out of the tent to crush and destroy? Or could it be both? Yod. We'll begin to unravel this mystery as we look at the Hebrew letter Yod, the fifth letter in Bereshit. Yod informs us that something amazing is going to unfold on the earth, something that will mark the end of one age and the beginning of something new, a new beginning. We know this has something to do with the prince coming out of his home in heaven, the prince coming out of the tent. Yod is the tenth letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Ten is an important number because the primary meaning of the number ten, Yod, gives added spiritual significance to the picture yod, the picture of the hand doing a divine deed. Yod, the number 10, is one of four sacred numbers, and it means ordinal perfection. The picture of yod, the hand and the arm, informs us that God has ordained a plan in heaven, signified by yod, the number 10, that is going to unfold as a mighty deed that is accomplished on the earth. Consider the number 10 for just a moment. Zero is not a number. In God's language, zero is a placeholder for something else, and that something else is most often time.
time. So now we know why the prince has come out of his heavenly home. He is coming to earth to accomplish something his heavenly Father planned and purposed in heaven that will happen on the earth at the appointed time. But what is that something? The answer is revealed in the final letter of Bereshit. Remember that Bereshit is the first word in the Bible. Notice that the last letter in Bereshit is Tav. Tav is the 22nd and final letter in the Hebrew alphabet. Whatever this something is will bring an end to one thing, as it begins another. Tav. Tav, the final letter in Bereshit, is pictured as a cross. To be clear, the earliest Hebrew pictogram display this Hebrew symbol or letter as a cross. The pictogram displayed in this article is a faithful representation of the earliest Hebrew letter, Tav, pictured as a wooden cross. Tav, the last letter in the Bereshit prophecy, informs us that the divine deed ordained in heaven, number 10, will fulfill a covenant that will be revealed as a sign that is literally pictured as a cross. This sign will mark the center point of all human history from God's perspective. Everything that happened before this sign was sovereignly ordained in order to set the stage for this one single event. This is the one event that God considers the single most important event to happen on the earth, and God has ordained it to happen at exactly the precise appointed time on his 7,000-year calendar for mankind. Everything that happens going forward from this sign, the sign of the cross, is as a direct consequence of this epic event. Whatever man may think is important pales in significance to what God thinks is important. The cross marks the spot from which we can forecast every epic event that God has planned for mankind in the future. The sign is now history, and the answer to why did the prince come out of the home in glory has been revealed. The Son of God left his home, his home in heaven, to come to the earth in order to accomplish his heavenly Father's plan and purpose to redeem mankind. This accomplishment took place on a rude wooden cross that lifted up the Son of God on a mount we know as Calvary. This accomplishment reversed the covenant that man had entered into with death and hell, and opened the door and fulfilled the covenant that God had made with His Son to redeem man and become the very door that leads to the place that Jesus said He was going to prepare for all those that love and trust him. All those that have been redeemed by the atoning sacrifice of the perfect Lamb of God are now destined to enter God's home, prepared by Yeshua for those he redeemed with his precious blood. Bereshit is all about home, and it's all about new beginnings. The central beginning, in view, has now been revealed, but there are more. Has the Bereshit prophecy been completely revealed and fulfilled? The answer is not even close. The Bereshit prophecy has only been partially revealed and has not been completely fulfilled. So far we have answered the question, who? We have been introduced to the central person in the Bereshit prophecy, the central personality in all man's history. We now know the name of the Son of God, the Prince of Glory. His name is Yeshua HaMashiach. His name is Jesus the Christ. Do we understand why? Yes. Man is a result of the sin of Adam and our own sin are in bondage to the curse of sin and under the wrath of God. The Prince of Glory left his heavenly home to atone for our sins so that we might be justified by his sacrifice and have eternal life and enter into the home that Jesus has gone to prepare for us. There is another why that has not been answered. Why has this prophecy been hidden for almost 3,500 years? Why is it being revealed now, nearly 2,000 years after the cross of Calvary? Why now? The Bereshit prophecy clearly reveals the greatest beginning of all time. It's not the six-day creation that's in view, but the beginning that ends man's covenant with sin and death and makes a way where there was no way. The way that's been open for us to enter our home in heaven, 
opened by the only begotten Son of God, who is the Prince of Glory, the Son of God who left his home in heaven to come to earth as a servant in order to joyfully accomplish his heavenly Father's plan and purpose to redeem fallen mankind in order that we might be invited into his home. The Bereshit prophecy notifies us that this divine deed would be accomplished on a wooden cross, and it reveals much, much more. If you have not listened to the Bereshit prophecy part one, you need to stop and listen to it before going any further. We're now ready to answer the two remaining questions regarding the major prophetic theme that's highlighted in the very first word in the Bible. When and where? When will the epic event take place? And where on earth is this going to happen? Does the Bereshit prophecy reveal where this epic blood sacrifice that atoned for sin, the sins of fallen man, would take place? The answer can be found in the Hebrew letter Sheen, the fourth Hebrew letter in Bereshit. The letter Sheen, as we learned, signifies pressing, gnashing, and destruction. Sheen is also the number 300. The number 300, Sheen, is used in connection with Enoch, Noah, Gideon, Samson, David, and Jesus to signify a supernatural victory over death. To discover more about Sheen, the number 300, we invite you to visit PassoverProphecy.com. Sheen is also the one number that is a shorthand signature of God's name, a name that signifies divine ownership. Take a look at the letter Sheen as it looks today in modern Hebrew. A picture is worth a thousand words. In 2 Chronicles 6, 6a, we read, But I have chosen Jerusalem that my name might be there. In 2 Chronicles 33, 7, we read, In this house and in Jerusalem, which I have chosen before all the tribes of Israel, will I put my name forever. Notice below that all three valleys that form the three fingers of Sheen all begin at Mount Moriah, the very spot where the Messiah offered himself up for the sins of man, the very spot where God said he would write his name. I have included an ancient map of Jerusalem. Notice that there are three valleys that come together at the base of Mount Moriah. The Kidron Valley on the right, the Central Valley in the middle, and the Hinnon Valley on the left. So in summary, the answer is yes. The Bereshit Passover prophecy reveals the very spot that God ordained in heaven in order to accomplish his grand purpose to redeem fallen man. Mount Moriah, the place Christians call Calvary, marks the spot where the Bereshit prophecy would take place. The final answer is, when will this happen? Does the Bereshit prophecy reveal when the epic event on Mount Moriah would take place? If so, where would we look for this clue? There is a time stamp found in the Yod and the Tob, the last two Hebrew numbers revealed in Bereshit, and those time stamps give us the answer. The two letters and numbers directly connect the sign of the wooden cross with the revelation that this sign is going to manifest itself at exactly the right time, a time appointed in heaven before the foundation of the earth. The same two letters or pictograms that revealed why the Son of God was coming out of his home in glory also literally reveal the ultimate sign of the times. The same two pictograms that combine the idea of a plan ordained in heaven, that's going to unfold on the earth at the appointed time, points us to the picture of the covenant and the sign of the wooden cross. The number Yod, or 10, is the key that unlocks the mystery of when this is all going to take place. Yod is God's divine multiplier. Yod often reveals that events will unfold on earth at the time appointed in heaven. The Bereshit timestamp prophecy is very simple to understand and needs little explanation. The Tav and the Yod provide the answer. 400 times 10 equals exactly 4,000. 4,000 years. Before we continue, I need to address the question of dating the death of Jesus. This is a topic that's been debated for the last 100 years. Tradition in today's church teaches that Jesus died in the year 33 A.D. 
Many of the early 1st and 2nd century church fathers taught that Jesus died in 30 AD, a belief that exists among most biblical literalists to this very day. Others believe that Jesus died on one of the two dates in between 30 AD and 33 AD. For the purpose of revealing the Bereshit prophecy, we have chosen to use the year 30 AD. It is our conviction that this date is the most harmonious with the literal biblical account. But please understand that irrespective of the date, the year, used, it does not change the revelation in the Bereshit prophecy or invalidate its time prophecies in any way. It only slightly shifts the time frame. Let's go back to the Yod and the Tav that gives us the first prophetic time frame marker in the Bereshit prophecy. A prophetic time stamp of 4,000 years. Keep in mind that we are looking at the Bereshit prophecy through the lens of the end times prophetic perspective that is based on the belief that God has communicated in both pattern and type and by direct revelation that he has allotted 7,000 years for mankind on this present earth. This perspective is called the Millennial Day or Sabbath Millennial Day or Day for a Thousand Year Perspective. This method of calculating the unfolding of time, whatever name you prefer to call it, is the oldest prophetic biblical perspective on the earth. The concept is very simple and easy to grasp. God gave mankind from the very beginning a seven literal day repeating cycle. God then revealed that from his perspective, that each literal creation day was a thousand years and a thousand years as one day from his divine vantage point. Leaving us in no doubt as to what he had in mind, he further revealed in his word the importance of the number seven. Throughout the Bible, the number seven, considered a sacred number, demonstrated one thing, divine completion. The basic concept is that God has given man 6,000 years to work. That work will cease at the end of 6,000 years to be followed by 1,000 years of rest. So in a nutshell, the 7,000-year millennial perspective believes that the age of mankind started with the year of creation, unfolds for 6,000 years of labor, and ends with the 7,000th year of rest. So now the question is, does the Bereshit Yod Tov prophecy reveal the precise year when the crucifixion of Jesus would take place? Are there exactly 4,000 years between creation and the cross of Calvary? If you believe in the millennial day for a thousand year perspective, you might say yes. The time prophecy is close enough. After all, if Jesus died on the cross in 30 AD, and the prophecy predicts that the cross event is going to happen 4,000 years starting from the creation date of approximately 4004 BC, well then, that's close enough. The problem is that when you do the math starting with the creation date of 4004 and going forward 4,000 years, you're left with an extra 33 or so years. For some, that is close enough, but for those that take God's word literally, it's a real problem. With the perspective that missing the mark by only 33 years is close enough, it would be impossible to predict the future events on God's millennial calendar with any precision since a thousand years is no longer a literal time span but simply a rough estimate. Is there evidence in the Bible based on prophetic times revealed as harbingers of future events that would warrant this sort of variation and imprecision when it comes to God's revelation regarding when something is going to take place. In other words, when God says a thousand years, can we take him seriously and literally? Or are we to take it just as an approximation? So let's ask the question again. Does the Bereshit Yod Tov timestamp prophecy reveal the exact precise year when the crucifixion of Jesus would take place starting from the 4004 BC year of creation and going forward 4,000 years? The answer is no. Now let's look at this from another perspective. Let's consider that God, in his great wisdom, did not provide us the exact year of the crucifixion starting with the countdown from creation. Instead, God provided us with something much more amazing. God provided us with a measuring rod that reveals time in 1,000-year increments 
a millennial view that is designed to take us right back to the first chapter of Genesis, where we're meant to consider again the meaning of the six days of creation, six days of labor followed by the seventh day of rest. Do you see the prophetic pattern that forecasts a millennial reign of Messiah in every cycle of the six days of creation followed by the seventh day of rest? Notice the weekly pattern that God designed to repeat hundreds of thousands of times as both a rehearsal and a prophetic harbinger that heralds the final seventh day. Is this a foreshadowing of the 1,000-year millennial reign of God's Son on the earth? Of course it is, and it's pretty hard to miss. God has provided us a millennial time span that is complementary and consistent with the six days for a 1,000-year pattern God set forth as a pattern in Genesis chapter 1. Consider the one day with the Lord is as a thousand-year revelation that is revealed in both the Old and the New Testament, a divine perspective that is ultimately confirmed by the Lord Jesus himself, who reveals six times in the book of Revelation the exact time period of his seventh day upcoming kingly reign on the earth. The seventh day, the final day, that will last exactly 1,000 years. If the seventh day is exactly 1,000 years, then the other six days must also be precisely 1,000 years each. Six days equals exactly 6,000 years. This is the foundational numeric concept that fueled the Sabbath millennial end times perspective that is the oldest eschatology in the world. This is the prophetic view that was held by both the ancient Jewish rabbis and the early church fathers. The millennial perspective is now out of favor with biblical literalists because it seems to have failed. Many Christians who believe that the millennial day for a thousand-year perspective calculated from the start date of creation in 4004 B.C. would climax in the second coming of Christ in the years leading up to the year 2000 A.D. When that didn't happen... Many Christians lost confidence in the accuracy of the millennial day for a thousand-year perspective. It seems that the millennial time clock is not as precise as some had imagined. Obviously, God has not failed, so perhaps the day for a thousand years is after all just an approximation and not to be taken literally. Should we just admit that the day for a thousand-year millennial perspective failed, or has man failed to understand it from God's perspective? Let's take a look at this from another point of view. Let's take a fresh look at this asking two questions. When did the Son of God die on the cross? And why did the Son of God die on the cross? When did the sign of the Yod and the Tob, the last two letters in the Bereshit prophecy, take place? The unfolding of history has given us the answer. Christ died on Passover in 30 A.D. Why did the Savior hang on the cross of Calvary in 30 A.D.? He died to reverse the curse that Adam and all his descendants, including you and me, are now under. He died as an atonement for the sin and rebelliousness of Adam and all his descendants, including you and me. With the when and why fresh in your minds, let's look one more time at the 4,000-year timestamp measuring rod that allows us to look back in time, starting from the crucifixion of Christ on Passover in 30 A.D. But instead of going forward, from the proposed date of creation. What happens when we look back in time 4,000 years from the cross of Calvary? Will we discover the millennial time stamp of 4,000 years is an approximation based on the start date of creation? Or will we discover the reason, precision, and majesty of this millennial prophetic time stamp from God's point of view? When we take this 4,000-year measuring rod and lay it on the timeline starting on Passover in 30 A.D. and go back in time 4,000 years, what event do we discover? We discover a date that no one has considered up until now. We discover a year whose monumental spiritual significance has been hidden for over 6,000 years. We discover the year 3970 B.C. 3970 B.C.? Why is this year important? Since 3970 B.C. is obviously not the date of creation based on biblical chronology, why is this date important? If we start at the cross on Passover in 30 A.D. and go back in time 4,000 years, it takes us to the year 3970. If we then start with the year 3970 and we go back in time another 33 and a half years, 
What date do we land on? The answer is the creation date of 4004 B.C. 4004 B.C. is the one date believed by students of biblical chronology to be the most reliable year to date the creation. Just to be perfectly clear, the creation date of 4004 is based on biblical chronology alone. Bishop Usher is not the only Bible scholar that believed that creation took place in 4004 B.C. Did you notice that I did not start this prophetic forecast from the starting point of creation in 4004 B.C. and go forward in time? No. I arrived at the 4004 date by taking the Bereshit Passover prophecy literally and then looking back in history 4,000 years and finally adding 33 and a half years to the equation. Now, if you're wondering why I added 33 and a half years to the 4,000 year forecast, here's the reason. 33 and a half years is the number of years Jesus was on the earth from his birth to his resurrection and ascension. If pattern is prophecy, then it is only reasonable to expect that the 33 and a half years of the sinless life of the last Adam, whose name is Jesus the Christ, would match up exactly with the sinless life of the first Adam in the Garden of Eden during the very brief Age of Innocence. We can reasonably surmise that the first Adam lived 33 and a half sinless years in the Garden of Eden before he spiritually died, the moment he sinned. Adam's sin resulted in immediate spiritual death and the onset of decay that would result in his physical death at 930 years old. The sinful act of Adam resulted in death and corruption to all his descendants, including you and me. Has God also clued us in to the one day is as a thousand year concept revealed by both the six day creation account and the physical death of Adam? Consider that God told Adam that he would die the day he ate the forbidden fruit, and yet Adam lived to be 930 years old. Was God notifying us as to his prophetic concept? of a day being as a thousand years in his sight. Did Adam, according to God's prophetic way of reckoning, physically die on the very day he ate the forbidden fruit, a day being on God's calendar as a thousand years? Is it surprising that the pattern set by the first Adam in the garden is duplicated with precision by the last Adam, Jesus Christ, who came to reverse the curse set in motion by the first Adam? Now, clearly, Jesus was 33 and a half years old when he died on the cross on Passover in 30 A.D. That's a historical fact. The Bereshit prophecy does not send us back to the date of creation. It sends us back to the precise moment that sin entered into the heart of the first Adam. Now we know why the year 3970 B.C. is important. The year 3970 B.C. is important because it's most likely the year that sin entered the world. 3970 B.C. Thirty-three and a half years after the creation of Adam is the year that God started the countdown of the 4,000 years that would climax in the sacrifice that would cancel the covenant with sin and death that Adam and all his descendants have entered into. If Jesus died on the cross on Passover in 30 AD at the age of 33 and a half, then by going back in time, 33 and a half years, we can determine that Jesus was born in 4 BC. 4 B.C. is the most commonly agreed upon date for the birth of Jesus. Now, if we go back in time 4,000 years from the birth of Jesus in 4 B.C., we are back to the creation date of 4004 B.C., the most likely date of creation. Do you see the perfect time pattern that overlays the sinless life of the first Adam in the Garden of Eden that ended in rebellion and sin after 33 and a half years in the Garden of Eden? Can you now see the pattern repeated in order to accomplish the cancellation of the sin debt caused by the sin of the first Adam, canceled by the sinless life, death, burial, and resurrection of the last Adam, who died on a cross in 30 AD, exactly 4,000 years from the moment sin entered into the world of man? Prophecy is pattern. Until the Bereshit Passover event unfolded in time and space, the Bereshit prophecy could not have been understood. The logic of this is seamless, simple, and profound. Sinless Adam did not need a savior for the first 33 and a half sinless years of his life in the Garden of Eden. But the moment he sinned, 
at the age of 33 and a half years old, he had a desperate need for a Savior. God is very precise in his dealings with man. Consider the precision and accuracy of the Bereshit Passover prophecy. God began the prophetic countdown to the most important event to ever happen in human history, the exact moment that marked the desperate need for redemption and atonement. That countdown started the clock ticking that would announce the coming Savior. That countdown started exactly 33 and a half years after creation and is the starting point for the millennial, Sabbath, end times prophetic perspective. Amazingly, the Bereshit prophecy revealed that we needed to reset the millennial perspective to a new start date that until now has been a mystery. The year that sin entered the world and the year exactly 33 and a half years after creation that marked with a big black X the starting point for the 4,000 year countdown to the cross. This begins to satisfy the Isaiah prophecy. But is the Passover prophecy the end God spoke about through his prophet Isaiah? The answer is no. The cross is not the end of the prophecy. It is a new beginning. There are two more time-stamped events yet to be revealed in the prophecy that we will now call the Passover prophecy that was fulfilled in 30 A.D. on a wooden cross on Calvary. The Passover prophecy reveals two more events that will seal your destiny. One of these events is on the cusp of completion. When it happens, your future will either be bright and unimaginably hopeful, or it will be filled with unspeakable terror. What does your future hold? Will you be ready and waiting for your Lord's return, or will you be so suffocated by the cares of this world that you can't be bothered to wake up and look up? I invite you to consider the final Bereshit Passover prophecy. The end is nearer than you ever imagined. The blessed hope for some, the advent of terror for others. For thousands of years, there has been one biblical prophetic perspective that's been obvious but blurred and out of focus, missing the final lens that once in place would bring the entire vista into sharp perspective. With the one puzzle piece that's been hidden in place from the very beginning, just waiting for the appointed time to be put into the right place in order that the terminal generation might view it at the appointed time just before God ends one age and begins another. The millennial historical time span perspective that is now in focus reveals for the first time when the most important events, the events that changed the course of man's history, took place in the past. It accomplished this not by going forward from the proposed year of the six-day creation account, but by looking back to the year of creation and the events that immediately followed the placement of Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. The 7,000-year millennial perspective, as it turns out, is filled with the unfolding of many dispensations over time, but only one condition and one beginning and ending that is in view from a divine perspective. And what condition is that? The condition of man's heart, the condition of sin and rebellion. The 7,000-year countdown did not begin with the six-day creation. The 7,000-year countdown was tragically initiated by the sin of Adam and has been amplified and magnified by his descendants in an ever-increasing crescendo of unspeakable tragedy. The 7,000-year countdown starting the moment Adam sinned has been characterized by a cycle of dispensations that all end in exactly the same way. No matter what new experiment is attempted to govern the wicked heart of man, it always ends the same. Whether it's anarchy or tyranny, democracy or socialism, whether ruled by many laws or few, whether governed by judges, kings, or God himself, it always ends up the same way. Man's heart betrays all forms of governance. It rebels against everything that is good and holy as it reveals itself to be wicked, untamable, rebellious, and self-destructive. There is only one solution to this problem, and it is not within the power of man to exercise its promise or potency. Man is in desperate need of a new heart, a recreated nature that is joyfully in glorious harmony with his creator. 
Is this the lesson that man is to learn as he arrogantly schemes and plans his utopian fantasies? Man without God cannot achieve the latest version of an upgraded and improved man. It is madness to think that, aided by superintelligence and technology, the false promise that echoes from the serpent's malicious lies will accomplish what only God the Creator can accomplish. And what is that? A new heart. The first word in the Bible, Bereshit, reveals a millennial perspective that is so accurate and precise at forecasting the past that we dare not ignore what it forecasts for the future. It is no wonder that God has not disclosed this before now, saving it for the final generation. The generation living in the last fleeting years of time, time that is passing quickly and moving with speed toward the next event that God has ordained to happen both just in time and at the exact appointed time on his millennial day for a thousand year calendar. To be precise, you are literally living on the razor's edge of a nearly 2,000-year countdown that is only a few short years from completion. You are living in a time of signs that have not been seen since the time of Noah. The corruption of man has reached the boiling point, the inflection point, when iniquity overflows the cup of God's patience and mercy. You are living in the generation that has seen the fulfillment of the one event that notifies all the earth that God is sovereign over all the affairs of men and nations, we have been a witness to the most unlikely historical event to ever take place in human history, the miracle of the regathering and reestablishment of the nation of Israel is no longer a pipe dream believed by a fringe group of biblical literalists explained away by the faithless Bible teachers who are so brilliant at allegorizing and spiritualizing away God's promises and filling all those that follow them with arrogance and pride, a pride that is astonishing in face of God's literal fulfillment of his unbreakable promises. Israel has been brought back to their land in unbelief, just as the Lord both promised and foretold. This generation has witnessed the coming together with intensity and frequency of the earth signs of earthquakes, pestilence, wars, famine, tornadoes, hurricane, tsunamis, and volcanic eruption that Jesus said would accelerate in a chorus of converging, ever-increasing cycles of calamitous prominence that he compared to birth pains, birth pains that have never before been witnessed by any previous generation. Even the most hardened sinner, living outside the influence of God's Spirit, knows that something is wrong and something frightful is on the near horizon. The children of the light, according to the Apostle Paul, will not be overtaken by the day. The day that the Prince of Heaven slips through the open window of time that's been allocated from the beginning to demonstrate God's grace to the nations, the time we call the church age. The children of light know the season of the Lord's return is upon us. There are signs in the heavens, signs in the earth, signs in the unseen world of evil spirits manifesting in our time and space dimension. Signs all around us that are prophesied to cause fear in the hardened hearts of those who have rejected God's anointed one. Signs that are meant to encourage and increase to the point of exuberance the blessed hope that is the birthright of every Christian pilgrim in the world. Pilgrims who long with all their heart to be escorted in the twinkling of an eye into the presence of our Lord and Savior taken to the place Jesus said he was going to prepare for us in heaven. Christians, who were once only occasionally vexed by the downward tiptoeing into the dark shadowy corners of sin, are now shocked by the plunge into the septic dank sewer of depravity and disorder that is happening on a wholesale basis all around us. For these discouraged saints, the Lord is unsealing a revelation hidden from all the other generations that lived on the earth, preserved for the unveiling to the final generation in order that Christians would be courageous in the last moments of time, moments not wasted on sleep, but rather moments in which we are meant to awaken and look up with eyes filled with faith and hope, in spite of all the forces of evil that war against the simple truth that our salvation draweth nigh and is even now at the door. We are now ready to disclose the two remaining final time stamp revelations found in the very first word in the Bible, exactly where we began 
this inquiry. Let's read the words of the Lord as recorded by Isaiah the prophet one more time. Isaiah 46, 9. Remember the former things of old? For I am God, and there is none else. I am God, and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning. There are two more timestamp revelations in the Bereshit prophecy that will literally fulfill the declaration made by God as recorded by Isaiah the prophet, declaring the end from the beginning. The Bereshit fire prophecy. In part one of the Bereshit prophecy, we discover that the first word in the Bible, the Hebrew word Bereshit, the word literally translated in beginning, was not just about one beginning, but contained a prophetic picture and number revelation that heralded multiple beginnings with one major thematic beginning in view that overshadowed all the others. You might have guessed that the Bereshit prophecy was about the six-day creation miracle followed by the seventh day of rest, but it was not. Instead, we discovered the beginning that heralded the 7,000 years of sin and rebellion that began with the sin of Adam, 33 and a half years after creation. And what beginning was it that forecast the year Adam sinned? It was the beginning that took place in the fourth millennium on God's calendar, the beginning that took place on Mount Moriah, where the greatest accomplishment to ever take place in human history was manifest on a wooden cross that lifted up the Prince of Heaven, who had humbled himself and come to earth as Emmanuel, God incarnate, in order to satisfy the sin debt of Adam and all his children, including you and me. Now we will unfold the two remaining millennial timestamp prophecies that are just waiting to be revealed. Let's see if we can discover the prophetic timeline and the picture prophecy that literally fulfills the Isaiah 46 prophecy. Let's see if we can find the end from the beginning in the first word God revealed to man, the word Bereshit that literally means in beginning. It is unusual, to say the least, to find even one word nested inside another word in the Hebrew language, but to find five Hebrew words nested in one Hebrew word is clearly astounding and obviously meant to arrest our attention. We have already identified four of those Hebrew words that we found nested in the six-letter Hebrew word Bereshit. Can you remember what they were? Let's review them. Bet, in or inside. Bet resh, pronounced bar is the Hebrew word for son. Beth Resh Aleph, pronounced bara, is the Hebrew word for created. Resh Aleph Sheen, pronounced resh, is the Hebrew word for the head person, the prince, the first. These four words were obviously nested in the revelation in order that it might clearly notify us that the Son of God was in the house, that the Son of God came out of his house. It also disclosed to our amazement why the Son of God came out of his heavenly home. Amazingly, there is one more important word nested in Bereshit, a Hebrew word spelled Aleph Sheen. Aleph is the third, and Sheen is the fourth letter in Bereshit. The picture meaning of Aleph Sheen is pretty easy to figure out based on the pictures. Aleph, pictured as an ox, represents strength. Sheen, Pictured as teeth is meant to convey the idea of crushing and destroying like the gnashing of teeth. Put the Aleph and the Sheen together and you have the picture of strong destruction. Do you know what strong destruction God had in his mind? We've already seen how Sheen was used as a picture to forecast the cross. Is there another crushing and destroying on the horizon? The answer is yes, and God leaves us in no doubt as to what will cause the destruction. Aleph Sheen, the fifth Hebrew word nested in Bereshit literally means fire. The Yod and the Sheen tell us when this fire is scheduled to take place on God's millennial calendar. And when is it going to take place? Yod, 10, times Sheen, 300, equals 3,000. 3,000 years from the center point of man's history, the date of the cross in 30 AD, Bereshit prophecy is forecasting fire. Now anyone that's read the Bible does not need to guess as to what the single shocking word is forecasting. Our present world is going to end in a fiery conflagration. When is this going to happen? 
We now know the answer based on the Bereshit Passover prophecy. Starting from the center point of all history in 30 AD and then adding 3,000 years takes us to just 1,000 years into the future to the year 3030 AD. 3030 AD is exactly 7,000 years from the year Adam sinned and was expelled from the Garden of Eden, 33 and a half years after creation. And what is it that comes to an end after 7,000 years? 7,000 years that mark the complete destruction of our present heaven and earth? The answer is what puts us back into God's millennial perspective. Seven is one of four sacred numbers that means divine completion, and you do not need to have a Ph.D. in theology to figure out what comes to an end after 7,000 years. Sin, rebellion, and wickedness, and everything it touched and corrupted, including the very world that God pronounced good in the very beginning, has become polluted with sin and rebellion and must come to an end. Fire not only marks the end of the seventh millennium, it also inaugurates the beginning of a new sinless eternity, heralded by the creation of a new heaven and a new earth. It is the appointed time when God will roll up the current heaven and earth like a scroll and put a match to it just as he declared in his word. Listen to what it says in the New Testament book of Second Peter. Second Peter 3.7 but the heavens and the earth, which are now, by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. Second Peter 3.12 Looking for and hasting unto the coming of that day, wherein the heavens, being on fire, shall be dissolved, and the elements shall melt with a fervent heat. God said he would declare the end from the beginning, and he has done it literally with a precision that cannot be denied. The prophecy in Isaiah has literally been fulfilled in the beginning. Literally, in the revelation of his word beginning, God has declared the end from the beginning. And he did it in a way no one could have ever dreamed. God accomplished his word from the center point of history in 30 A.D., it is from that divinely appointed time that we can date the six days of creation followed by the seventh day of rest. The creation event took place in the year 4004 B.C. This was followed by 33 and a half years of innocence and sinlessness in the Garden of Eden that ended abruptly with the sin of Adam, 33 and a half years from the start date of creation. And now we know the end of the present heaven and earth is scheduled to perish by fire in the year 3030 A.D. We are now living roughly a thousand years before the final fulfillment of the seventh day Sabbath millennial perspective that will end 7,000 years of sin and rebellion. We are now left with one more time stamp prophecy, the final Bereshit prophecy. Like the other two before it, the Lord has left little doubt about what this prophecy is about. A prophecy that will unfold when the rash the Prince of Glory, leaves his home one more time in order to accomplish the next phase of the unfolding plan that his Father in Heaven purposed before the foundation of the world. But this time the rash, the Prince of Glory, will not be coming as the sacrificial lamb to be mocked, beaten, and killed. No, the Son of God is coming out of his home in Heaven with a roar and the shout of victory. He is coming as the conquering Lion of Judah. King Jesus is soon coming to establish his thousand-year kingdom on the earth. The king is now waiting in heaven for exactly the right moment at the appointed time to come again as the conquering king of the whole earth. So when is this going to happen? The answer is found in the picture of the rash, the prince coming out of his home to accomplish the yod, the plan, the plan of God. The picture that reveals this event also reveals that this event is going to happen on God's millennial calendar. The time stamp of 2,000 years, or two millennium, added to the 30 A.D. Passover prophecy gives us the answer. Startling as it may seem, the year of Christ's second coming is no longer thousands of years into the future as it was in the first century church. It is upon us. It is forecast to happen based on the Bereshit Passover prophecy in the year 2030 A.D., the Bereshit Passover prophecy forecasts that 2,000 years from the crucifixion date of 30 A.D., the Lord is coming to establish His kingdom here on the earth. This is where people, including many Christians, are all mixed up and confused. The coming of the Lord, that no one knows the day or the hour of, 
is not the second coming of Christ, but the coming of Christ to collect his church. Now, if you're confused about this, I would suggest you open your Bible and start making a list of all the verses in the New Testament that describe the second coming or the coming of Christ. What you will discover is that there are at least 20 categories that either highlight major contradictions in the Bible or 20 categories that describe two different events. The departure of the church, popularly called the rapture, is not the same as the second coming of Christ, which is also called the glorious appearing. The coming of Christ in the clouds to collect his church has as its purpose the escorting of saints off the earth, the earth that is about to experience the wrath of God. The second coming of Christ is all about the Lord coming with his saints to establish a thousand-year kingdom here on the earth. The second coming event has so many prophetic time stamps and signs connected to its fulfillment that it's hard to keep track of them all. Obviously, anyone who has a Bible during the Great Tribulation can consult it and know exactly when the second coming is going to occur. Anyone that tells you that no one knows or ever will know the year that Christ is coming again is either ignorant of the facts or confused. To be clear, the Bereshit prophecy does not forecast the year when Christ is going to come and collect his church, but it does forecast the season. The translation of the pictures and numbers in the first word in the Bible reveals three time-stamped events that are all based on a fourth event, the one event God has magnified above all others, the centerpiece of all history, the cross event that took place in 30 A.D. Now we ask, just how many beginnings are forecast in the Bereshit Passover prophecy? If we count the cross, there are four events directly forecast in the first word in the Bible, are there others? Based on the millennial day for a thousand-year perspective, we can now put a timeline on a couple other important events that are now for the first time clearly in view and time-stamped based on the Bereshit prophecy. Amazingly, the Bereshit prophecy reveals seven beginnings, all knowable and arranged in order on God's millennial calendar. Let's briefly review all seven prophetic beginnings that chronicle 33 and a half years of perfection on the earth, followed by 7,000 years of man's allotted time on the earth. Number 1, 4004 B.C. The six-day miracle creation begins, the beginning followed by the seventh day of rest, the beginning of the first man, Adam, who was sinless, for 33 and a half years. Number 2. 3970 B.C. The beginning of sin and rebellion, the year Adam sinned, 33 and a half years after creation. Number 3. 30 A.D. The new beginning that opened up the way to heaven based on the atoning death of the last Adam, Jesus the Christ, who accomplished our salvation on a wooden cross as prophesied the beginning of the church age. Number four, the departure of the church, the new beginning highlighted for believers by a new glorified body fit and made for heaven and perfected in order that we might enjoy our Lord and Savior as we are blessed beyond reason to be in his presence forever and ever. Number five, 2023 A.D., Daniel's 70th week, also known as the Great Tribulation that lasts seven years and proceeds with no time gap, the second coming of Christ. The beginning of sorrows for the world and the beginning of discipline for God's beloved children of Israel, who will go under the rod of discipline in order that they might finally call upon Yeshua HaMashiach, with eyes of faith finally open to see that Jesus, Yeshua, is their Savior. Number 6, 2030 A.D. The second coming of Christ, the beginning of the millennial reign of Christ on the earth that will last for 1,000 years. 
And finally, number 7, 3030 A.D., by fire, the end of the present heaven and earth and the creation of a new eternal heaven and earth, the beginning of the eternal state. You will notice that I did not forecast a year for the departure of the church. There is currently an open window of time through which the Lord is going to slip through and collect his church. That window of time has been slowly closing for almost 2,000 years, and it's almost shut. We know that the departure of the church could happen at any time. And now we know that while the window of time appointed for his coming could close today or tomorrow, we simply do not know exactly when the Lord is coming, but we do know that the window of grace will slam shut no later than 2023 A.D., the same year that begins the seven-year Great Tribulation, also known as Daniel's 70th week. The window of time that was fully open nearly 2,000 years wide in 30 A.D. is now only open five years wide as of the production of this article in March of 2018. Does this mean that we have five years before Christ comes to gather us into his presence and take us home? No, it means that we could have up to five years before Christ comes to gather us into his presence, or we could have only minutes before we are in his presence. The Bereshit Passover prophecy is a set of very simple, forthright, and easy-to-understand collection of puzzle pieces made up of pictures and numbers. Once assembled, the Bereshit Passover prophecy contains the forecast that the Church of Christ will not exist on the earth after the year 2023. It may not exist on the earth after 2022 or 2021, or tomorrow. Only God knows. Remember that the church was a mystery, not revealed in the Old Testament. Is it a surprise that the exact day and hour that the bridegroom is coming to collect his bride, his church, is also a mystery? But while we do not know the exact day or time of day, we can forecast the number of years left in the open space of the window of God's grace through which the Son of God will come in the clouds to collect his glorified church body. Let me ask the Christians listening to this amazing end times perspective a question. Are you anxiously awaiting your Lord's return? If you are, then this revelation should be greatly encouraging to you. There is just a little more time. Be patient and keep living your life as if he was going to return today. He just may. Or are you, a confessing Christian immersed in the cares of this world, in love with its tantalizing distractions, pleasures, and attractions, that like a siren song cry out for all your attention? Does the thought of the Lord's coming soon sound like an inconvenient truth that you truly hope is not to be taken seriously? If the news that the coming of the Lord is going to really happen and soon does not elevate your spirit to heights of glorious anticipation, then something is wrong with your life of faith and you need to repent of it and get your eyes back on Jesus alone before you are standing before him consumed by shame and regret. The Bereshit prophecy is the most amazing warning you will ever hear in this lifetime. Heed it and get back to loving the Lord who redeems you with his precious blood and return him to the center of your life, which is exactly where he belongs. If you're not a Christian, I would plead with you not to perish. Come to Christ while there is still time, before the one thing you have taken for granted slips away and is lost forever time. You may think you have all the time in the world. The Bereshit Passover prophecy has been revealed to you so that you might know that the appointed time for the church of Jesus Christ to be joined with their Savior is only moments away. You do not want to be left on the earth after that event takes place. If you're not a Christian, it is time for you to acknowledge your sin and your desperate need for a Savior. It is time to pray for God's mercy and grace as you look with eyes of faith to the one, the only one, who shed his precious blood so that you might be redeemed 
and claim the promise that's been written for your encouragement and redemption. Listen to this message and consider that it has been sent to you in order that you might escape the wrath to come. Listen to what Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. This concludes the translation of the first prophecy revealed in the Bible. Revealed but hidden in the beginning, so that you might be warned at the appointed time that Christ is coming to collect his church. Will you be ready?